Hey all, this is David Ducker coming back at you, and today I'm going to be talking about how to build a culture, uh, or how I build cultures in my game at least, and then I'm going to love some feedback about how you guys do it at home as well. So when you're going through uh, building a culture for your game, basically, you know, I, I'm pretty uh, lawful in alignment. I, I pretty much have a template that I follow. Uh, kind of a character sheet for cultures, if you will. Uh, so I start with the basics, the bare necessities of life, as Baloo would say. Uh, food, shelter, clothing. And these are also things that can really add so much uh, in the characterization of your cultures as well. Uh, what they eat, you know, where they live, uh, and... Uh, what they wear and what they look like. So let's go through a couple of different examples. So sometimes you might start out uh, with where where they live. So let's let's pick on uh, dwarfs. So dwarfs live in the mountains. So and we kind of already know uh, what their shelter is like. You know they build these elaborate underground cities. Uh, so, you know, their shelter is already pretty much done. Uh, and now we, when we start thinking about uh, clothing and food, you got to think what is available in the mountains uh, for them. And I think, well, okay, uh, let's get some mushroom growing underground. So that's some food. Let's think about goat herding up in the mountain valleys. Uh, so that's some more food. And goats also provide wool and milk for cheese. Uh, and then you got the mountain valleys. Okay, well, let's flowers, uh, bees, beekeeping, honey. Honey makes mead. Great. You can even start to think about, uh, you know, for me, I've introduced kind of a uh, fictional animal, like a rock dove, but about twice as large. And dwarfs eat a lot of those, and they also breed them. It's not, it shouldn't be very hard to uh, breed a rock dove up to double size. Uh, there might even be, for those of you who know about uh, dove breeding or pigeon breeding, uh, you might even tell me, you know, what's the upper limit on, on how big you can get them. Leave that in the comments below if, if Mike Tyson's watching this. <laughs> so to, in my game, then, you know, dwarves are great cheese makers. They drink mead. They eat a lot of goat. Their clothes are made out of uh, wool from sheep. They eat a lot of those rock doves. Uh, their, their cuisine incorporates a lot of mushrooms and honey and milk. Uh, so, so, you know, I've I fleshed out so much uh, of their culture right there. Uh, let's contrast against elves. Uh, so elves live in the forest. Uh, and in my game, you know, high elves specifically live in extremely large trees that they build their cities in the boughs of. And these trees uh, being magical, they're called elf trees. These trees uh, grow every kind of fruit uh, that, you, that you could want on them. So elves eat a tremendous amount of fruit. They're almost fruititarians, uh, which actually for humans is not a very healthy diet, actually. But for elves, uh, their biology is different, so we'll say that's fine. And they make a lot of different fruit wines as well. Uh, and because they live in the forest, they hunt a lot, and they even do some gathering as well, uh, especially of herbs. So, uh, you know, for clothing, uh, since they hunt animals, you can go with a lot of leather, uh, a lot of fur. Uh, they eat, you know, game meat such as venison and uh, such as rabbit, quail, uh, other other, you know, game animals out there. So you can really flesh out their food, and you know they eat a lot of fruit. So if you're there, it's going to be like a fruit dish and some some game animal, and then maybe something else like a salad. Uh, and their clothing, you know, like I said, lots of leather, lots of fur. Especially high elves would probably be pretty big on fur. Uh, oh, and I've also added elves actually have uh, silkworms. They've mastered uh, silkworm husbandry. So silk in my games typically comes from high elves in their elf trees, so they wear a tremendous amount of silk as well, uh, as well as linen. So, you know, again, you fleshed out just by these basics, food, shelter, clothing, uh, 
He fleshed out a lot of their culture right there, just with these three categories. You know, I hate to see games where they, they don't think about just these basics. And I, I'm like, well, what do the dwarves eat? And go, uh, 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 you know, or worse, they'll add what they eat, but they won't think about how they get it. They'll say, oh, dwarves drink ale. Where do they get the, the grain for ale? They live in the mountains. Uh, I don't know. So in my game, dwarves drink mead, which they get from honey, which they get from bees in the, in the wildflowers in the mountain passes that they control. And of course, they fight with goblins over who gets these mountain passes, because goblins love them some honey as well. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it all kind of is connected. It makes, it doesn't have to make the best amount of sense. It just has to be somewhat plausible, you know. And uh, once you start with a little plausibility, you can you can build on that, you know. So uh, that's food, shelter, clothing, and then I move into more uh, uh, oh, tertiary characteristics. So this would be uh, government, military, religion. Uh, so yeah, let's let's just pick on those those of my next three. So government, who's in charge? Sometimes this is the military or is the religion, uh, but sometimes it's not. Uh, you know, oftentimes it's not. Uh, so again, let's pick on uh, let's let's pick on ogres. So uh, ogres actually have two slightly different uh, modes in my game. Uh, ogres just left to their own devices out in the the plains. Uh, they're patriarchal. So they're a family group, and the oldest male is their leader, and that's their government. Uh, ogres in the city, ogre cities, uh, form a council of merchants. So uh, you know the the ten richest ogres in the city, uh, they kind of uh, form the, the government uh, by themselves. So that's how their government works in the cities. Um, and then, you know, so once you've got that uh, fleshed out, and some will be more complicated, like a democracy can be more complicated, or a royal line can be more complicated than that. Uh, then you move into their military, which again should tie into uh, their locale and, uh, you know, their, their resources. So, uh, so for the military, for elves, since they live in the forest, uh, there's a lot of guerrilla tactics. So a lot of archers, um, and since they live in the forest and they don't have access to a lot of metal, their primary weapons are going to be spears as well. Uh, same thing again. Orcs. Orcs also live in the forest, uh, so they prefer axes because they can use them to cut trees down. And their other uh, primary weapon is also axes because they're throwing axes. So they like hand-to-hand -hand with axes or at range, they still have axes. Um, and it makes sense based on their environment. Goblins like picks, because you can use picks to, to cut through stone as well. Uh, dwarfs uh, enjoy hammers because they can be used for smithing as well. well. Not the same hammer, but I mean culturally it's a symbol that they, they enjoy. You won't use a war hammer to, to smith something to forge something just like a goblin won't use a war pick against a wall but culturally it gives them these traits to fall back upon and uh, you know by the same token dwarfs and goblins living in the mountains can afford to build themselves armor they have lots of metal whereas orcs and elves don't really have any metal so their armor is just going to be made out of leather uh, so again, the military should tie back into the other uh, options, and it can tie back into the government as well. You know, uh, feudal society, their government and their military are basically the same. Uh, you could get something more like a, a republic, where the government and the military are separate. They have a standing army, and how a standing army uh, functions in battle versus how feudal levies function in battle are going to be very different. You know, standing armies are trained, very disciplined all year long, whereas feudal armies, just the leaders are, are going to be very elite. 
and most of the troops are not. So you get an elite leadership cast, uh, and then a lot of kind of just goons, uh, which may or may not have good armament. Versus something like, uh, you know, ogres, where they nobody's very well trained or disciplined with ogres. Ogres themselves are actually fairly peaceful. Um, they do maintain slaves, but their their slaves don't typically form standing armies of any kind. Uh, so so their tactics uh, individually are not going to be very good. Their organization is not going to be very good. Uh, fortunately, they have other benefits working for them. They're very large, and they have uh, they have innovative wagon forts or loggers which are very useful to them. But individually, one-on-one, -on -one, they're, they're not very skilled or disciplined. It's just that they have this one tactic that really works despite their lack of discipline uh, and that their whole culture is kind of set up to, to utilize. So they still can be effective in their way. Um, and then come back to uh, religion. So religion can, again, tie into the other two you know, um, goblins uh, have a strong affinity for bats. They both live in caves. They both are communal, but they hunt s singly or alone. They love this uh, kind of metaphor. Um, to come through to, I think, uh, lizard folk, for example, they tend to worship, uh, you know, single deities. They, they tend to... Uh, really value individual achievement so it makes sense for them to have an individual soul deity as the king of everything the king of the world is their god and then their god you know will compete against other gods so one lizard folk uh, city might worship quetzalcoatl and another might worship kukulkin and quetzalcoatl and kukulkin are almost the same but the two city-states will fight each other in the name of their gods to prove which is better, even though they're almost the same. And this ties in very well to their military and their government uh, as well. So it should all just kind of reflect different aspects of the same f ideas. The same themes should be present everywhere for the societies. Uh, so, and then the last thing after, you know, food, shelter, clothing, government, military, religion. The last thing I go through with uh, any, anything I think I'm missing. So typically, you know, I'll, I'll run through my, my main archetypes. What would a fighter be like? What would a priest be like? What would a wizard be like? And what would a, a thief be like from this culture? Some cultures, that they have a lot of room for thieves to get developed. Assassins, cat burglars, con men. Some don't. Uh, some cultures have a lot of room for wizards or sorcerers to get developed, and some don't. So th th that can be very subjective. You know, I tend towards lawful cultures have clerics and wizards, uh, whereas chaotic cultures have druids and sorcerers. Mixing and matching can be a lot of fun, can provide a lot of depth. And that can reflect in the martial cast as well, barbarian, ranger, uh, fighter, uh, paladin. And um, there are probably some other martial class you can throw in there as well. So that, that's pretty much it. Just run through your food, shelter, clothing. Run through your government, military, religion. And then run through your odds and ends. Especially paying attention to uh, you know, what the players will be interacting with, which is usually like shopkeepers and uh, blacksmiths, uh, innkeepers, uh, be working in taverns, even what kind of entertainment they would have in a tavern uh, in this culture and society. And then, you know, if you players want to be from there, run through those archetypes, the thief, the uh, arcane caster, the divine caster, and, and the fighting man. So I think that's pretty much it. Uh, I'd love to hear how you create cultures for your game, uh, what you think of my method, and, uh, you know, of course, I'd love to hear about what, what cultures you have created for your game, but that might be a little beyond the scope of the comments section. So uh, I don't know if I'll ask you about it, but I would encourage you to post your own videos about it. I, of course, have done a lot of videos on different cultures. 
um, that I use. Uh, typically, they're divided by race. Some races are robust enough to have multiple cultures. Uh, elves, dwarfs, and humans uh, would be the primary ones. Although, uh, you know, you can look at it from the perspective that, you know, race is kind of a misnomer. So, you know, are, are an orc and a goblin really different races? Or are they different uh, cultures within the same race? Uh, but I'll do a whole other video on that topic uh, uh, at some point as well. So I'm going to be signing off now. I hope you enjoyed the video. Everybody have yourself a good day. Cheers.